Chapter 2. Believers ought to make the mortification of indwelling sin their daily work. Having laid this foundation, a brief confirmation of the aforementioned principle of deductions will lead me to what I chiefly intend, that the choicest believers who are assuredly free from the condemning power of sin ought yet to make it their business all their days to mortify the indwelling power of sin. So the Apostle, quote, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, Colossians 3, 5. To whom does he speak? Such as were, quote, risen with Christ, in verse 1. Such as were dead with him, in verse 3. Such as whose life Christ was, and who should appear with him in glory, verse 4. Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. Your being dead with Christ virtually, your being quickened with him, will not excuse you from this work. And our Savior tells us how his Father deals with every branch in him that bears fruit, every true and living branch. He purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. John 15, 2. He prunes it, and that not for a day or two, but while it is a branch in this world. And the Apostle tells you what it was his practice. I keep under my body, and bring it unto subjection. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I do it, says he, daily. It is the work of my life. I omit it not. This is my business. And if this were the work and business of Paul, who was so incomparably exalted in grace, revelations, enjoyments, privileges, consolations, above the ordinary measure of believers, where may we possibly bottom an exemption, which bottom means uh, find a basis for, where may we possibly bottom an exemption from this work and duty while we are in the world? Some brief account of the reasons hereof may be given. Indwelling sin abides, therefore it must always be mortified. Indwelling sin always abides while we are in this world, therefore it is always to be mortified. The vain, foolish, and ignorant disputes of men about perfectly keeping the commandments of God, of perfection in this life, of being holy and perfectly dead to sin, I meddle not now with. It is more than probable that the men of those abominations never knew what belonged to the keeping of any one of God's commands, and are so much below perfection of degrees that they never attained to a perfection of parts in obedience or universal obedience in sincerity. And therefore, many in our days who have talked of perfection have been wiser and have affirmed it to consist in knowing no difference between good and evil. Not that they are perfect in the things we call good, but that all is alike to them, and the height of wickedness is their perfection. Others who have found out a new way to it by denying original indwelling sin and tempering the spirituality of the law of God unto carnal men's hearts, as they have sufficiently discovered themselves to be ignorant of the life of Christ and the power of it in believers, so they have invented a new righteousness that the gospel knows not of, being vainly puffed up by their fleshly minds. For us, who dare not to be wise above what is written, nor boast by other men's lines of what God has not done for us, we say that indwelling sin lives in us, in some measure and degrees, while we are in this world. We dare not speak as though we had already attained or were already perfect, Philippians 3.12. Our inward man is to be renewed day by day while we live, 2 Corinthians 4.16. And according to the renovations of the new are the breaches and decays of the old, breaches being... Um, gaps, broken areas. 
While we are here, we know but in part, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, having a remaining darkness to be gradually removed by our growth in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 18, and the flesh lusts against the spirit, so that we cannot do the things that we would. Galatians 5, 17. And are therefore defective in our obedience as well as in our light. 1 John 1, 8. We have a body of death. Romans 7, 24. From whence we are not delivered, but by the death of our bodies. Philippians 3, 20. Now it being our duty to mortify, to be killing of sin while it is in us, we must be at work. He that is appointed to kill an enemy, if he leaves striking before the other ceases living, does but half his work. Galatians 6, 9, Hebrews 12, 1, and 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Indwelling sin not only abides, but is still active. Sin not only, sin does not only still abide in us, but is still acting, still laboring to bring forth the deeds of the flesh. When sin lets us alone, we may let sin alone, but as sin is never less quiet than when it seems to be most quiet, and its waters are for the most part deep when they are still, so ought our contrivances against it to be vigorous at all times and in all conditions, even where there is least suspicion. Sin does not only abide in us, but the law of the members is still rebelling against the law of the mind. Romans 7, 23 And the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy. James 4, 5 It is always in continual work. The flesh lusts against the spirit. Galatians 5.17 Lust is still tempting and conceiving sin. James 1.14 In every moral action it is always either inclining to evil or hindering from that which is good or disframing which means dismantling disframing the spirit from communion with God it inclines to evil the evil which I would not that I do says the apostle in Romans 7.19 Whence is that? Why, because in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing, and it hinders from good, the good that I would do, uh, that I do not. Verse 19, Romans 7. Upon the same account, either I do it not, or not as I should, all my holy things being defiled by this sin. The flesh lusts against the spirit, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Galatians 5:17 and it unframes our spirit and thence is called the sin that so easily besets us Hebrews 12 1 on which account are those grievous complaints that the apostle makes of it Romans 7 so that sin is always acting always conceiving always seducing and tempting who can say that he ever had anything to do with God or for God that indwelling sin had not a hand in the corrupting of what he did. And this trade will it drive more or less all our days. This trade being this pathway will it drive more or less all our days. If then sin will be always acting, if we be not always mortifying, we are lost creatures. He that stands still and suffers his enemies to double blows upon him without resistance will undoubtedly be conquered in the issue. If sin be so, watchful, strong, and always at work in the business of killing our souls, and we be slothful, negligent, foolish, in proceeding to the ruin thereof, can we expect a comfortable event? There is not a day but sin foils or is foiled, prevails or is prevailed on, and it will be so while we live in this world. I shall discharge him from this duty who can bring sin to a composition uh, result. Who can bring sin to a composition, to a cessation of arms in this warfare. If uh, it will spare him any one day, 
in any one duty, provided he is a person that is acquainted with the spirituality of obedience and the subtlety of sin. Let him say to his soul as to this duty, Soul, take your rest. The saints whose souls breathe after deliverance from, it, from its perplexing rebellion know there is no safety against it, but in a constant warfare. 